When you ask gamers what the worst 2D to 3D transitions are in gaming, most people will probably think of Mega Man, Final Fight, Earthworm Jim, Bubsy, not that that was any good before the transition, and one I don't agree with but has pretty much become the poster child for bad 3D transitions, Sonic. However, if you ask someone the same question 15 years ago, a lot of people would probably also say Castlevania. Castlevania was one of the franchises that defined 2D side-scrolling action in the 80s and 90s, and would revolutionize the genre even more in 1997 with the release of Symphony of the Night, which added non-linear progression and RPG elements. With some of the most beloved franchises in gaming like Mario, Zelda, and Sonic all making the transition to 3D in the late 90s, it was only appropriate that Castlevania would do the same. And in 1999, Konami would release the first 3D game in the series, simply titled Castlevania for the Nintendo 64, which was received actually pretty favorably from critics at the time, but after being covered more negatively by gaming YouTubers recently, it has developed somewhat of a poorly aged or not as good as we remember legacy, but even more recently has been making somewhat of a comeback from Defenders, but that's a can of worms I don't want to get into right now. The point is that the 3D Castlevanias aren't remembered anywhere near as fondly as the 2D ones, and even fans of Castlevania 64 at the time acknowledged that it wasn't as good as most of the 2D games. Not counting Legacy of Darkness, which was more or less a director's cut of Castlevania 64, or the cancelled Castlevania Resurrection for the Dreamcast, the second 3D Castlevania was Lament of Innocence, released for the PS2 in 2003, which was also received positively, but still not seen to be anywhere near as good as the legendary Game Boy Advance trilogy, and was compared negatively to Devil May Cry, which was the gold standard for action games on the PS2 at the time. After this, it seems like Konami had completely lost any sense of direction for Castlevania in 3D. In 2008, they released Castlevania Judgment, a crappy 3D fighting game exclusive to the Wii, and after that, they would reboot the franchise with Lords of Shadow, which was killed off after just a spin-off and a sequel, and the whole franchise has been dead in the water since, with it only getting re-releases and things I would rather not talk about. It really seems like Konami just never got a chance to properly adapt Castlevania into 3D. However, there is one game that I think stands out from all the others, and not only stands out as the best 3D Castlevania, but provides innovations that even make it stand out from the 2D games in some ways. That game is Castlevania Curse of Darkness. Curse of Darkness was released on November 1st, 2005, at the very end of the PS2 and Xbox generation. Much like the games I mentioned earlier, Curse of Darkness got mostly positive reception from critics, but reviews weren't as favorable as Lament of Innocence, and this game is largely overlooked by most fans. Having played this game for the first time a few months ago, I didn't have very high expectations, but once I started playing, I was quickly hooked on it. I found myself loving this game for many of the exact same reasons I love 2D Castlevania. That gothic Castlevania atmosphere, the beautiful artwork from Ayami Kojima, the electrifying soundtracks composed by Michiru Yamane, the satisfying combat, the challenging boss battles, the strategic RPG elements, the rich customization system, the exploration and satisfaction of finding secrets. This game had it all. It was able to recreate almost everything that I loved about 2D Castlevania, something that, in my opinion, Lament of Innocence failed to do. I made this video because I want to share with you all my experience, and why I think Curse of Darkness is not only the best 3D Castlevania, but a great game overall that stands out as one of the PS2's most underrated titles, and one that I think every Castlevania fan should play. But first, a word from our sponsor. I'm sure you've all heard the terrible rumors of male pattern baldness, and I think some of you have even seen it yourselves. Don't get me wrong, 
Baldness looks great on some people, but for those of us that like having long hair and want it to stay that way, it may be a good idea to invest in something to prevent hair loss. And for that, there is no better alternative than Keeps. Keeps is an FDA-approved hair loss prevention service that delivers high-quality products personalized for all your specific needs to your door at half the cost of most pharmacies. Not to mention, you also get access to 24-7 support with a medical professional for up to a year. And Keeps offers more than just hair loss prevention products. Through them, you can also get shampoo and conditioner that have even won awards. So not only do you get to keep your hair, but it'll also be clean and smelling good. Because hair loss isn't reversible once it starts, I highly recommend checking them out sooner rather than later. Check out Keeps using the link down below in the description. That is keeps.com slash gnarly. I want to give a big thanks to Keeps for sponsoring this video. And now, let's get back to the video. Before I get into what makes this game great, I might as well get the biggest negative out of the way. The story. Granted, Castlevania has never really been that much of a story-driven game, and the story for Curse of Darkness isn't offensively bad or anything, it's just lackluster and disappointing. Taking place three years after the events of Castlevania 3, the story follows Hector, a devil forge master who used to work for Dracula, but later became disillusioned with him and defected, and later fell in love with a woman named Rosalie. One day, Rosalie gets framed for witchcraft and burned at the stake, and the man responsible for this is one of Hector's former comrades, Isaac, another Devil Forge master who is still loyal to Dracula. This definitely sounds like an interesting premise and a good enough reason to motivate you to help Hector in his quest to seek revenge against Isaac, but it's just not established or introduced very well. The main reason being is that this game explains the entire plot in a very brief introductory cutscene. Isaac addresses Hector as someone who betrayed Dracula, Hector tells Isaac that he's going to pay for the death of Rosalie, and Isaac then tells Hector that he wants revenge on him for humiliating him three years ago. This is all dropped on you in a three minute cutscene. We don't know anything about either of these characters aside from the fact that they're Devil Forge Masters, we don't know anything about Rosalie or what her relationship with Hector was like, we don't know how she died, we don't know why Hector betrayed Dracula, and we don't even know what Hector did to humiliate Isaac. This game just kind of expects you to care about and be invested in these characters with what little background you're given. Well, guess what? This is actually explained much better and even shown in the two-volume Curse of Darkness manga. I guess Konami basically wanted this to serve as the prologue to this game, seeing as how this was the mid-2000s when video games were finally starting to be taken seriously as a medium, and every developer and publisher wanted to push the boundaries of what video games could be. However, in none of the trailers or advertisements that I saw for this game while working on this video did I see so much as a mention of this. Perhaps that's because it didn't even officially get translated into English until 2008, and it wasn't even by Konami, it was by Tokyo Pop. Now, on his quest, Hector runs into several characters, like a witch named Julia who supplies him with items, a priest named Zed who points him to where Isaac is, Saint Germain, a time traveler who warns him not to get involved, and even Trevor Belmont. As Hector gets close to achieving his goal, he realizes that he's an integral part of a much more sinister plot. One of the reasons Isaac killed Rosalie was so that Hector would be motivated to go after him, which would in turn motivate him to strengthen his powers and become filled with hatred so that his body could be used as a vessel to resurrect Dracula. Zed is also in on the plot, he's secretly death, and after Hector refuses to give in at the end of the game, he uses Isaac's body instead, and then Dracula is fought as the final boss. Again, it's an interesting concept. I definitely like the idea of Hector having to continue his quest against Isaac while having to resist the urge to become consumed by hatred because, while Hector's main motivation for going after him is revenge, Isaac is still partially responsible for all the chaos that's happening around Wallachia, and still needs to be stopped. Isaac shows up every now and then just to provoke Hector, while Julia shows up to help calm him down, and they sort of act as an angel and devil for Hector. However, the game doesn't really explain to you exactly what this Curse of Darkness is. Once again, you'll have to read the manga to find out, but either way, it doesn't have much of an effect on the game at all. It would have been cool had they done something like where Hector's personality gets more aggressive further into the game, or maybe somewhere close to the end you get an option that determines whether or not you give into the curse. Kind of like the good and bad endings from Dawn of Sorrow, but there's nothing like that here. And even then, 
The whole idea of Hector succeeding and resisting the curse just feels kind of pointless because Dracula gets resurrected anyway. I think it would have been much cooler had Hector prevented Dracula's resurrection along with Isaac's death by fighting Chaos from Aria of Sorrow, the source of Dracula's power. I mean, yeah, they would have been recycling a boss from an earlier game, but that was in 2D. Imagine fighting that same boss in 3D, that would have been awesome. That being said, once you actually learn the backstories of the game's main characters, they're quite likable. You really gotta respect Hector for how devoted he is to avenging his dead girlfriend, but also the fact that he continues to pursue the antagonist, despite that being what they want, but he doesn't fall for any of their tricks. He just beats the crap out of them. In the cutscene where he fights Isaac, he fights with his bare hands, and he punches Isaac's devil so hard that it goes flying halfway across the arena. And I'm supposed to believe that this was the inspiration for Hector in the Netflix show? <laughs> Isaac, on the other hand, is just the perfect villain. He's just a madman that is so incredibly devoted to Dracula in his line of work despite him still being human. And his dialogue here is just perfect, with the way he taunts Hector, the way he just casually argues with Trevor while he's killing him. Fiend! What are you doing here? I can't have you interfering beyond this point. I left that seal to Hector. Impossible! The seal cannot be undone except by a torrent of demonic energy. Hector could not know that. Do not equate a Devil Forge Master's power with that of an ordinary sorcerer. For a seal like that, the magic produced in battle is more than uh, enough. Uh, <laughs> Placing a guard there proved to be your downfall. <laughs> enough talk. Time to die. <laughs> <laughs> However, this is much less true for two of the game's other major characters, Saint Germain and even Trevor Belmont, who both have little to no relevance to the plot. Saint Germain is trying to warn Hector not to get involved, presumably because he sees a future where Hector either gets defeated or gives in to the curse, but this is never actually confirmed. All that happens is that he shows up every now and then to warn Hector, then he's fought as a boss at the clock tower, and after that he's never seen or mentioned again. I can only assume that Konami had intentions to make him a returning character in future games, what with him and Zed supposedly knowing each other, him breaking the fourth wall, and even mentioning Dracula's defeat in 1999. The worst offender though is Trevor. He just so happens to run into Hector while investigating, and at first thinks Hector is the Forge Master responsible for everything, so they fight, but he stops after concluding that Hector isn't the enemy, and then just disappears until much later in the game. I mean, Trevor knows that Hector is on his side, and they both have similar goals, right? Why not team up? You know, kinda like he did three years ago in Castlevania 3? It really just feels like he's been shoehorned into the plot to remind you that this game is a sequel to Dracula's Curse, and he's the only character from that game that appears here. Grant, Sypha, and Alucard are nowhere to be seen. At the very least, Trevor is playable, but not until after you've beaten the game. It would have been much cooler to be able to switch between them like you could in Castlevania 3. This video may have sounded pretty negative so far, but all of this is made up for once you sink your teeth into the offerings of Curse of Darkness's gameplay aspects. Like I mentioned earlier, Curse of Darkness has a crafting system, and this has to be one of the most fun crafting systems I've ever seen in an RPG. You gather different materials which you find throughout the level, mostly by stealing or picking up off of dead enemies, of which there are dozens, along with dozens of weapons to craft and experiment with. You don't have to worry about finding the recipes yourself, as the game will automatically tell you what you can fuse once you have the required materials. Another thing that's cool is that a lot of the weapons can simply be upgraded by combining them with the right materials. You may come across a new material that you can use to upgrade or create a new weapon, only to then realize you can do it again and again and again. Most of these materials aren't hard to get, but some of them are quite rare, and in a few cases, you only have one opportunity to get them. If you miss that, you're out of luck. 
Some people may not like this, but I think it adds an extra layer of resource management to this game. You really have to think about what exactly you're going to use some of these rare materials on. At least that's the case for most of the more powerful late game weapons, and if you want to stand a chance against any of the late game bosses, you're going to need one. The best thing about them is that there are no limitations on what you can craft other than having the required materials. A lot of the more powerful materials aren't available until late in the game, but if you know the secrets of the game well enough and or you're good enough at stealing from enemies, you can get certain materials much earlier than normal and craft some extremely overpowered weapons relatively early in the game. It's easy to get sucked into this crafting system. I often found myself backtracking and grinding for materials just so I could have all the weapons that I wanted. Like I mentioned earlier, there are a lot of different weapons in Curse of Darkness, and I have to say, they got really creative with some of these weapons. Pretty much every possible type of sword, spear, axe, or whatever you can think of is in this game. But some of them are even references to media completely unrelated to Castlevania. For example, you have the Laser Blade, which is basically a lightsaber from Star Wars, the Pico Pico Hammer, which is the hammer that Amy uses in the Sonic series, the Force Glove, which is basically the NES's Power Glove, a Molotov Cocktail, a Frying Pan, and even a freaking minigun. Did I mention that this game takes place in the year 1479? This system is great not only because of all the options you have, but it allows you to choose what you get to do with your resources. There's nothing worse than going through a difficult pathway only to be rewarded with a weapon you don't want, which has happened to me very often in Castlevania games. This crafting system alleviates this, because with the materials you get, you can make the weapons you want. In fact, you don't even have to make weapons, you can make armor too. But I haven't even gotten into this game's second main gimmick, that being the Innocent Devil system. In addition to being able to craft powerful and magical weapons, Devil Forge Masters are able to control monsters called Innocent Devils. These are very similar to the monsters you fight throughout the game, but they don't have any malicious intent. They instead just do whatever their master tells them, which is why here they fight alongside Hector. Hector will find these Innocent Devils at various points throughout the game, and most of the time, they have abilities that are required to move on, but they'll also fight alongside you in battle. They mostly act on their own, but you can control how they act in battle with commands, and you can also have them use their special abilities which will consume hearts, which also serve as their health bar. If you run out of hearts, they'll disappear and won't come back until you can get back a certain amount, and they're fairly common drops from enemies and candles. And also, each innocent devil has its own heart meter, so if you want, you can just switch to another one during battle after one runs out. But there's more to it than just that. Innocent devils actually level up just like Hector, and also evolve, and how they evolve depends on what type of weapons you're using. Enemies when defeated will sometimes drop these colored crystals that differ depending on what kind of weapon you defeated them with. And once you get enough crystals of the same color, the devils will evolve. So, while you're probably going to have a favored weapon type throughout the majority of the game, this system encourages you to use weapons of different types. Some innocent devil types even have special abilities that allow you to get to areas of the map that aren't required, but contain special items. For example, in the Forest of Jigramont, you may come across these statues that are lined up like bowling pins. If you have the Ite Innocent Devil with Shoulder Ride, you can knock these down and get a Dragon Scale and a Rare Ring. Innocent Devils are divided into different types. You have the Fairy Types, which specialize in healing, the Battle Types, which are focused on protecting you and helping you fight, Bird Types, which are focused on aerial combat, Mage Types, which have a lot of unique magic abilities, and Devil Types, which are sort of jacks of all trades. Oh, and there are also the Pumpkin Types, which don't do much on their own, but greatly improve Hector's stats. Which is another thing. Not only do IDs assist you in battle, they even increase Hector's stats, in case you didn't think there was already enough depth to this system. Oh, and I forgot to mention that if you do mess up and have an Innocent Devil evolve into one you don't want, you will get more chances, as Innocent Devils drop Devil Shards, which are basically eggs that can hatch into new Innocent Devils. Their stats are always 10% of their parent stats, plus their base stats, so they'll get stronger with each generation. Now, the combat is one of the more criticized aspects of this game, and while it's nothing revolutionary for a PS2 action game, it is without doubt the best Castlevania's combat has ever been in 3D. I don't know if this is much of a hot take or not, 
but to me, Lament of Innocence's combat never really had the same satisfaction of many of the games that inspired it. Curse of Darkness addresses almost everything wrong with the combat of Lament of Innocence, with combat that feels fluid and has a lot of the punch that that game lacked. Hitting enemies just feels satisfying. The sound and visual effects with each successful swing of your weapon make the combat system feel much better than in previous games, and there was never a time where I felt like I was at an unfair disadvantage. It's not uncommon for the game to throw several enemies at you at once, and sure, it can be frustrating when you start getting knocked around by them over and over, but most of these situations can be avoided with a few well-timed dodge rolls, and it's even more satisfying when you beat a large group of enemies. The boss battles, on the other hand, just like the 2D games, all have distinct patterns to their attacks, and there's a lot of trial and error, but when you figure out how to beat them, it is very rewarding. The combat system has been streamlined to where your attacks are no longer divided into weak and heavy, instead you attack with just the square button, but this doesn't mean there aren't combos. The circle button normally doesn't do anything on its own, but if you press circle in the middle of a combo, it will follow up your last attack with a combo finishing move, which is usually a more powerful attack that differs depending on how far into your combo you were when you pushed it. Other than that, it has all your standard moves for an action game on the PS2. You can lock onto enemies, block attacks, dodge, roll, parry by hitting the block button at just the right time. You can even steal items from enemies by pressing circle at just the right time when targeting them. This is a very important mechanic because, just like I mentioned before, it's necessary to get some important materials and bonus items. Most of the enemies are easy to steal from, but there are a few where you have to get pretty clever, like the flame demons for example. They're flying enemies that are only vulnerable shortly after an attack, but because of the direction they fly in when hit, it's impossible to steal from them in time. What you have to do is quickly order a mage type devil to time stop, attack, then right when it wears off, you jump into the air and steal from it. It's tedious at first, but rewarding once you get the hang of it. And this is a perfect example of an important material that can be used to create some very powerful weapons. As far as presentation is concerned, Curse of Darkness looks pretty good for a PS2 game. I haven't played the Xbox version, but I've heard it looks about the same. Either way, it definitely does a good enough job of creating the grim atmosphere of a Castlevania game. But the environments themselves are pretty bland. I mean, they do the job but they don't really have any of the finer details that allow you to truly appreciate it. The enemies and character models, though, look great, and there are a lot of different enemies here. While a lot of them do reuse and recolor models of previous enemies, in most cases, they have different attacks and or traits that make them stand out from one another. It's nothing groundbreaking, but there are a few parts where the presentation really shines and stands out from the rest of the game. Two examples that come to mind are the fights against Death, and Dracula. Now, this isn't to say that the other bosses in this game aren't cool, I mean there's hardly anything not cool about fighting a Belmont in an abandoned church, but these fights in particular really create the spectacle and feeling of helplessness that you should feel against a giant evil entity that towers over you. This is especially true for the Dracula fight with the way you're standing on this tiny little island in this place that's just surrounded by this spiraling mess of darkness and the way he flies around on screen. I know I complained earlier that it would have been cooler to fight against a different boss at the end, but this is definitely one of the coolest fights against Dracula in the series. My favorite part of the whole game, though, is the fight against the Legion. In my gun-only run of Aria of Sorrow, I talked about how immersive the fight against the Legion was. Imagine that in much more detail and in 3D. This is another optional boss, and you'll find it at the end of this hallway, where you won't see any dead bodies walking towards it, but the hallway will be lined up with skulls, and as you get closer, the walls will be covered in some weird red stuff. You'll still hear the groaning, and once you get to the boss room, you'll see the floor made up of dead bodies. The walls will be pulsating, and in the middle of the room is the Legion. As you fight him, you'll be attacked by these dead bodies awkwardly limping toward you, and once you expose and deal enough damage to the core, you'll now have to fight Nuculeus, a malignant entity made of light born from the core of the Legion. This fight even has its own music, and it's nothing like the adrenaline-pumping boss themes you've been hearing. This one really makes you feel scared. 
Speaking of, the music in this game is absolutely beautiful. It's no longer just ambient noises or soft background music. The energizing soundtracks of the 2D games have finally been recreated for the 3D games. And this is some of Yamane's best work. Every soundtrack is a perfect fit for each area. You have the exciting, but also soothing soundtracks that play while you're exploring. powerful, blood-pumping boss themes. and the intimidating, fear-inducing themes that play in the later dungeons. And these are just a few examples, though I feel if there is one thing I need to complain about regarding the soundtrack, it's the way the background music is interrupted for the encounter theme whenever enemies start appearing. That's not to say this isn't good either, but I'd much rather just keep listening to the level's background music than have it be interrupted for this at least once almost every screen. What about the voice acting? Well, I already talked about how this isn't much of a story-focused game, and the cutscenes are pretty short, but for what little voice acting there is, it's done very well here. Hector is voiced by Crispin Freeman, who not only voiced Matthias in Lament of Innocence, but also voiced Heat in Digital Devil Saga, and is probably best known for Alucard in the Helsing Ultimate anime, which is pretty awesome. Isaac, on the other hand, is voiced by Liam O'Brien, and for as much voice work as I've heard him in, I actually didn't recognize him at first, and he definitely plays this role better than anyone else I could think of. He gives it his all every time Isaac is on screen, and it only gets better every time. It all comes together when you finally confront Isaac at the end of the game for that last great performance. Mine. I've been waiting quite a long time to plot my revenge. Not only did my lord die because of you, you stripped me of my pride, my home. Now I shall make you suffer as I suffered. You shall die a most painful, gruesome death! Curse of Darkness is a game that I went into with little to no expectations, but it turned out to be an excellent action RPG with some unique systems that really make it stand out among the rest of the series. It's a perfect example of a game that, in spite of all its flaws, still manages to shine by doing very well at what it excels at. Supposedly, this game didn't sell very well. According to VG Charts, both versions combined sold just over half a million units, which isn't horrible by any means, but these numbers weren't as high as Lament of Innocence, and not what Konami was hoping for. The critical reception wasn't very glowing either. On Metacritic, the PS2 version currently only sits at a score of 70, while the Xbox version sits at the not-so-much-better score of 74. At the time, these were the two worst meta scores for any 3D Castlevania game, even lower than Castlevania 64, and I can only assume it's a large part of why we never got a sequel or a game that used any of these mechanics. Which is a shame, because had Konami given this another shot, while addressing the game's problems mainly with the story, with better graphics, improving the combat, and adding to the already stellar crafting and innocent devil systems, it could have easily been a masterpiece, and maybe even stand out as one of the best games in the franchise. Worst of all, from this point on, it seems like Konami wanted nothing to do with this game, and left it to fade into obscurity. In 2013, 
Lament of Innocence got a digital re-release on the PS3 online store, but not Curse of Darkness, and the Xbox version was never made backwards compatible with the Xbox 360, Xbox One, or Series X, and it's not available on PC either. The only sort of recognition this game has gotten recently is having characters from it being included in the Netflix series, even though I already complained about how badly they butchered Hector, and Isaac has almost nothing in common with his video game counterpart aside from his name. Although, I do think Netflix Isaac is a good character for different reasons, and is probably the best thing about that whole show. It's unfortunate, but what we got was still an extremely fun game with solid combat, great music, and an addicting RPG system that I think is a must-play for any Castlevania fan. And that is why I think Curse of Darkness is the best 3D Castlevania game. And that is going to be it for this video. I hope y'all enjoyed, and be sure to tell me what you think. Also, be sure to rate, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff, and if you want to support me financially, consider leaving a Ko-Fi donation of just $3. Until the next video, I will see you all later.